Constitution in the Classroom started about six, seven years ago, and our mission, our purpose, the reason we organized, the reason we created these lessons is to teach the Constitution. Um, everything that's in it, the preamble, the articles, and to discover really the consequence of the Constitution. What did it do for this country and the people of the world? We um, also have the goal of teaching historical facts um, so that we can actually learn the, the genius of the Constitution, learn to think like the founders. How did they come up with this great success formula? We want to present to you from uh, history how this came to be that we would have such a successful uh, Constitution. Um, discovering go America's godly heritage. Uh, we also teach the importance and the impact of the Declaration of Independence. And as, as you see these slides um, in the presentation, many of them come from the classes that we teach students. We have uh, lessons for third grade through twelfth grade now. And so you'll see a little bit what we're teaching. And um, we hope from these groups of uh, adults who come that we can interest others to become teachers with us. But I found that really every one of you are or can become a teacher. In your circle of influence, you can let people know things about the Constitution that will help promote um, our liberties and and help counter the uh, great influence in this country that's trying to destroy it and where you would never hear of of a candidate favoring socialism 20 years ago even 10 years ago the ideas that are taught on college campuses and across this country are growing uh, and they're destructive of the Constitution so as you learn this today and with each of the lessons it will give you ideas of things you can discuss with your families, things you can talk about with your friends. How can you actually, in your way, teach about the Constitution to help spread um, how important and how of great worth it is to us and great worth to be preserving? Okay, so in our lessons, we're going to put aside politics and just discover the documents. And we know that when we get a bunch of conservatives together or people interested in what's happening to our country, there's often a tendency to want to discuss what's wrong and what's, you know, the problems with our country. We kind of want to take a more positive approach, teach you the documents, and, and not delve into a lot of political discussion about problems going on, okay? Um, we want to be able to teach with conviction. It's interesting if you know the story of Thomas Jefferson. You know he was a great um, studier, reader of the book of books. Well, he hadn't done anything with governments and law until one day he happened to overhear uh, Patrick Henry in the Virginia House of Burgess giving his famous speech, "Give me liberty or give me death." And when Thomas Jefferson heard that. He was so fired up, later in his life he said, that was the most important day in my life. And so he then turned his attention to studying governments and law and what kind of government this country should have. You know, he goes on to write the Declaration of Independence. He was so powerful in the formation of, of the freedoms that we enjoy. And it all came from one person giving this passionate speech that fired him up. So, we want to be the Patrick Henry to lots of other Thomas Jeffersons. So I hope that you really can value what you're learning in these lessons and watch for the opportunity to teach, to be those who spread principles of liberty. Okay? Awaken patriotism in everyone. On the back of your um, booklet, is a quote that is kind of almost the mission statement of Constitution in the Classroom. Um, let's see, who would like to be a reader? Would someone read that for us? Good. Go ahead. General <coughs> Statesman President 
George Washington, a primary object should be the education of our youth in the science of government. And what duty more pressing than communicating it to those who are to be the future guardians of the liberties of the country? All right. So he presents it to us as a duty, a duty that's pressing. What, what is more pressing? Um, in our lessons, we study the science of government. And you'll see, especially in lesson two, what is the science of government? And so uh, this is what is so empowering to us as teachers in classrooms. When we go in, we have lessons, uh, a set of lessons that's for kindergarten, I mean, third through um, fifth grade. And then we have another set of lessons, Constitution Defenders, which is for junior high and then the Constitution Scholars, which is high school level. And so with these lessons, we actually go into the classroom and, and teach. We've taught hundreds, even thousands of kids now over the last four years. So it is um, so important that we try to counter all the negative that's going on across this country. All the important principles, all the important information about founders and, and real history of this country has been lost in our, our students' uh, school books. So we try in this five lesson effort to try to um, give to them what they're missing and what is so valuable, what they need. So we, um, one thing we want to do is to go back to the day of the founders we want to understand the original intent and learn to think like a founder. Just discover what they uh, were saying in their quotes and, and in the information that gave them ideas to create our Constitution. Debbie, do you have a question? Uh, so most of this you got from um, the Federalist Papers, a lot of it? Right, right. Oh, I meant to mention, too, um, Actually, quickly turn in your workbook. I, I'm going to be introducing the rest of this to you, but near the end, page 27. So our purpose here with the adult classes is in five lessons to just whet your appetite and give you an introduction into constitutional study. So these are the books here that we've used to create these lessons. Uh, the most important one listed at the top is 5,000 Year Leap, which has been a valuable textbook for anyone who really wants to understand where the success formula came from for the Constitution. So this is a valuable study and these books here. Also online courses down here at the bottom. Um, there's several places you can go to get free lessons on the Constitution. So there's a wealth of information and we hope to just kind of get you excited about it, help you discover um, that there's um, valuable um, information to learn and it's well worth our time um, to be doing that. And um, so anyway, this will help us to think like a founder and um, as Diane said, this is where our material comes from that we use for these lessons. Original documents, going back to um, all the original quotes and information. Okay, so our, our focus is to be historically correct. You know there's a lot of political correctness out there and things you can and can't say and, and there's just a huge effort to minimize, diminish, cancel everything about the Constitution and the Declaration. There is um, a lot of evil trying to destroy the liberties that we enjoy. So. Um, there's political correctness that sometimes hinders going back and teaching exactly what the founders taught. So our focus is to be historically correct. And um, this is kind of a fun quote from um, John Taylor, I mean, uh, John uh, Adams <laughs> here. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes or inclinations, or dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. So, when what we present to you is factual, and being based on fact, then 
we can help people really rediscover our history and um, know what historical correction, correctness really is. Okay, um, there's been a lot of effort to um, diminish um, Jefferson, um, a lot of, of misquotes about him. Uh, Jefferson, you know, wrote the Declaration of Independence, and we have a whole lesson on the Declaration to help you discover its value to people today. And the, the misquotes and information that has been written in the last hundred years about him uh, to demean and to discredit him, um, the, the effort has been to, uh, with uh, pure falsehoods, marginalize what he accomplished. And um, so if we're going to safeguard our true heritage, our true history, then we need to go to the original quotes. It's interesting, um, I was going to read you a, a, one of the things that um, Thomas Jefferson said, that um, even in his own day, there were so many people who wrote things about him, claiming that he was not religious, claiming that he was... Uh, uh, a deist, and so he um, says, sometimes when I read what I'm described as, I wonder who it is, because it doesn't seem like me at all. And, and it's interesting that, uh, that that would happen with uh, being passed on down through the, the years, and a lot of very negative written about uh, Thomas Jefferson. So we want to bring to you the real Thomas Jefferson and discover how great he was. Um, all right, first question. I, I kind of need to know how much you already know about the Constitution and what has the Constitution done for you? This is a question we pose to students in school. What has the Constitution done? All right, go ahead. It tried to keep the government off our backs. Very good description, yes. It was a new approach to government because America was under tyranny in the beginning, under King George, and um, so a whole new approach was decided. As we go through these lessons, um, uh, what we want to do with students and with you is help you discover what the Constitution has done and, and be able to um, be excited and have reason for why we want to preserve it. Um, so how many have read the Constitution? Very good. That's excellent. Okay, so if I know that you kind of have a, a foundational understanding of the Constitution, then that will help me adjust to what, what we teach. Um, you have the Constitution booklet, and we're going to be going through that as we uh, go through the lessons, so be sure you bring them each time. And your workbook... The purpose of it is listed right here on the front. Um, if you were um, not a citizen, you could use these lessons and this book to prepare for the civics test to become a citizen. Um, we ha have found that our material covers what is needed for that test. So we offer that especially to high school students because they now are required to pass the civics test in order to graduate. So. Um, just so you know that. Uh, it's also in this booklet as well. Um, as you go through and you're filling in the blanks, it will help you to recall important information, help you to uh, focus in on things that are important to know, and then be a, a source of review for you when you have opportunity to share with others. So that's kind of the purpose of the book. Um, the first part goes lesson by lesson, so you'll use this same book for all five lessons. And then um, over on page 21, um, it, it begins the supplement section. So we'll point these uh, pages out as we go along as they fit into lessons, and um, we'll be using the information that's in there. Okay? So um, you can keep your books open to lesson one. And as, as much as I try to um, discuss exactly what's there, sometimes I skip over that, and you can 
um, just so you know, if there's questions that we don't specifically read and give you the blanks, the answers are in the back. So you can use it for a, a study uh, guide and, and fill in those that, we, that you might have missed during the lesson. Okay. All right. This is what farming was like in the day of the founders. Do we farm that way today? Isn't that amazing how much it's changed from this to this? And how long has it been? How long have we had our Constitution? About 240 years. About 240 years. Okay. So in 240 years, we advanced from this type of farming to this kind of farming. Okay. For centuries, how did people travel? Isn't that amazing? If you look back at ancient Egypt, it's fun to see their old pictures and it helps you realize the ancientness of this way of travel. And then how do we travel today? In 240 years, we changed from this to this. Okay, what about communication? Here's how we communicate today. How did we communicate in years past? In our lessons, we use these two stories because they're kind of fun. Um, does anyone know where the marathon came from? Why are the marathon races named the marathon? It's just a fun little communication story that we share with students. All right, well, I get to tell you then. <laughs> um, in the year 490 BC, there was a huge battle between the, the Persians were attacking the Greeks in, in, in the coastal town of Marathon. And the Persians had been sweeping across, conquering every nation, one after another. They came up to the Greeks. This battle, there's huge detail online. You can research and learn a lot about the battle be, at, in 490 BC in Marathon because it changed the history of the Western world. Had the Persians won and dominated Greece and Rome, then we would have had a different history. So this battle is hugely covered and a lot of fun information about it. Our purpose is that when the battle was over, they sent a messenger to Athens to warn them that the battle that they would soon be attacked and to be on guard and ready. But in Marathon, they won. They won the battle. So they sent the runner from Marathon to Athens, and he ran 26.22 miles to Athens, ran into the city yelling, Nike, Nike, which is the ancient Greek word for victory, and then collapsed and died. Anyway, it's a fun story about communication. The only way they could warn Athens was to send a runner. Okay, so then we're going to advance up to 1775 AD now, and Paul Revere's right. Why was he going from Boston to Concord and Lexington? To warn people that the British were coming to Concord. To warn people through. that the British were coming. So how did he get there? Did he text? Did he phone? Did he? <laughs> okay, so how many years between 490 BC and 1775? 264, 65. Yes. <laughs> right, 2,265. Okay, so we have a lot of fun with our students being able to visualize this. You want me to um, yes, that would be great. Okay, so this is our timeline, and it has about 4,000 years on it, which um, isn't the whole history of humankind, but a good part of it. So you'll see on the tape, on the um, rope, the the yellow tapes are 100 years. So that's a pretty good amount of time, <coughs> but, but small on here. I'm going to hold that in. And the blue marks are 1,000 years. So as you go down the line, here's the beginning of the changeover from a BC to AD. We talk with the students about how you measure time. And while we're on this then, we find where the marathon battle was and when Phidippides made his famous run, right here. 
okay? So then um, the green tapes on here are inventions. There's a few here and there, okay? Not very many, but there's a few. And red ones are just important events. Um, here is an important event, invention, the printing press. Here's Columbus, Jamestown, the beginning of the colonies. Way down the line, isn't it? So our country hasn't been around for very long. Then we come to 1775, the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Founding Fathers. Okay, so here's our time frame for the technology leap. So in this short time after the Constitution, this is what happened. And students can then see how amazing it was that all the way down through history, people are walking, people are riding horses. If you want to communicate, you send a runner if, or send a letter. And how long does a letter take? If you want to... Um, depends it, on the runner. <laughs> depends on the runner. <laughs> But if you like Pheidippides and make that run and <laughs> die in the end, that's kind of amazing. That's the way the story goes, anyway. But this helps students to see, and hopefully it makes an impression on you, in your minds too. Can you see what the Constitution did? This technology leap happened in this 200 year time frame. And all the way down through history, there were very few inventions. There was nothing that changed. Farming was by hand in ancient Greek, the same as it was in the day of the founders, until we have the Constitution. So we're going to show you how that came to be. What is in the Constitution that made that happen? That's what we want students to see. We want you to discover so that you have some appreciation for the Constitution. Okay? So and this became the age of invention. And uh, so what we're going to do now is look in at the beginning of our lesson one. Um, I'd like somebody to read for us uh, the first paragraph um, about the technology leap. Anyone want to volunteer? Okay, go ahead. Drafters of the United States Constitution authorized Congress in Article One, Section 8 to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing the limited claims to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their writings and discoveries. Under the American system, genius was redefined as the opportunity of the many, not the rare gift of the few. The United States Patent Office became the engine of an invention and allowed for genius to soar to its highest. Isn't that impressive? Isn't that amazing? That Constitution did that. It was from the Constitution that the technology leap um, got its momentum. Okay, go ahead and read the next, next part. The patent system was praised as one of the great institutions of American Republic and the engine of invention and prosperity, a prime cause of the nation's remarkable inventiveness. Many rags to riches stories affirm the virtues of hard work and strong moral character. The poor mechanic may be put into possession of an idea that by development could place him among the rich of the land. People were empowered to attempt improvements in the details of a new invention creating a cycle of perpetual development. The Age of Edison by Ernest Freeberg. That's one of the books on your list. Uh huh. Do you have a question? May I suggest that property rights is one of the things that exactly under the Constitution allowed this to happen? Because in Europe, there were the lords and the and the commoners. Yep. And exactly. So slavery, slavery, in essence, was flourishing. Was the common for everybody. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and that's why the immigration to America was strong, because people wanted, wanted, wanted to be here. Be right. To Would you like to just come up here and teach lesson one? <laughs> that is exactly right, and we're going to see even more about that. Thank you. I'm just glad to know. See, most people generally kind of know these ideas. 
But we want to be able to have <coughs> talking points. When we encounter someone who's right fresh from college, these young kids who are being indoctrinated and hearing all kinds of propaganda, we want to have things to say to them to teach them about the, what happened with the Constitution, how it came to make such a difference. So um, this is exactly it. So those first two questions come from that that you just read. Okay? All right. So what changed? Actually, it's 240 years ago. It was the freedom of one country. And um, we're going to discover, as we study the Constitution, then how it made this all come about, this technology leap. This, you know, so you can say when someone says, what's the Constitution done for you? Well, we have these electric lights. I have my car out there. I don't ride a horse anymore. I don't grow my own food. I have plenty at the grocery store. These are things that actually are benefits, the consequence of the Constitution. And a lot of people have never really made that connection. So it's a fun way with young students, with kids, to let them know what their Constitution did for them. And through these pictures, they can see um, what, what the advantages they now enjoy from that. So it was the freedom of one country, the United States, and um, the beginning of what we call self-rule. All right? Um, in our lessons, we're going to discuss and actually learn how this happened, how the Constitution made it all happen. Um, so before we go into that, uh, we want to go back to, as uh, Lionel was saying, what was it like before the Constitution? What prevented this? I mean, there were smart people down through history. They could easily have invented the same things we enjoy. What prevented it? That's what we want to look at. It was government that prevented it because rights, power, and wealth was only held by the king, the sars, the sultans. You know, they had all these different names, but they all behaved the same. It was tyranny. It was ruler's law. And we have um, much the same thing today, just with different names. But the individual was held down in poverty. They were the subjects of the king. They were the property of the king. And um, they weren't allowed to own property. There was just this wealthy core at the top surrounding the, the ruler who had, and they together had rights, power, and wealth. And we left the individual down in complete poverty. And it's the same thing today. There we have a new form of kings, same thing, tyranny, ruler's law, and <clears throat> they in their own countries have held people down the same as in the old world. Okay? Then, with the coming of the Constitution, we had the individual rise up to where they had opportunity for rights, power, and wealth. And the government was set up to serve the people. So now, the Constitution is written to hold government down, to control it, to put limitations on it, to make it serve the people and be, belong to the people. All the individuals now have rights, power, and wealth. And this opportunity was, was provided to, to everyone. Every little Mechanic, like it said in that, in that quote, isn't that amazing that we could do that complete switch from the way things had been? Um, so what kind of opportunity then came with the Constitution? Opportunity was provided for individuals. What kind? To right? benefit from their, their own ideas the benefit, right. They benefited from their own things, and we're going to talk about more about that too. Okay? And responsibility is required. What responsibility do you have that came with the Constitution? In, in the day of kings, or even today under kings and rulers, 
who has main responsibility for individuals? The tyrant, the king. They, the people belong to him. The people are to serve um, and, and benefit the community of, as a whole. They aren't important in and of themselves. So this is what came. Now, responsibility comes with being in a government that is self-governing, where government is to serve the people. The people need to have a knowledge of, of government in order to, to make it function. Okay? So there's the two dates, and I think that's in your book. Very easy question that <laughs> actually stumps a lot of students, especially this date here. Did all of you know September 17th? Now, all of you should be planning on September 17th some big event, just like the 4th of July. We always encourage our students to acknowledge, to recognize Constitution Day. And um, fortunately here in Gilbert, there's a Constitution Fair that's going to be on Saturday the 17th this year. And you can take your families and go down there and celebrate our Constitution, Ralph? Well, on that particular day, in fact, on both of those days, I have a big old Bessie Ross flag that I hang out in front of the house. Uh -huh. Good. Uh, people want to know what, what it is. <laughs> Diane? Where did you come from? <laughs> I've only gone to the fair once in Gilbert, but it was fabulous. And it's huge. Yes, it is. It's so good for, you know, yes. for little kids to yep. great grandparents. Yes, <laughs> it really is very good. Okay, so there's our two documents that we're going to be studying, and um, they are, are both in here, and so we'll be able to read them as we go along through our lesson. We want to know what's in them. Um, we want to be looking at the consequence of these documents in these lessons so that you have things to say to someone who might be feel, leaning towards this new pop propaganda on socialism. We want our students to know clearly the difference between the two so that they can um, have something to say about it. They can make a, an intelligent decision. So you see this is so valuable that we get, get out into more and more classrooms and teach more students these principles. Okay, so to jump right in to our Constitution, um, and also I'll refer you now to the supplement in your book. Um, there is a summary page on 21. This gives you a brief outline. This top part is the Constitution in a nutshell. So, how many, how, how many articles are there? Do, who knows? Seven. Seven. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and then amendments. How many amendments are there? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Okay, so there's just a brief summary, and um, you can begin to study that over a little bit. And what I want you to learn um, is there is a, word, a number coding to help us go specifically to a clause in the Constitution when we want to discuss it. So... Um, the first number, like this with number one, refers to the article, one of the seven articles. Okay, that's number one, so that would be article one. The second number refers to sections. So if you look in your constitution, you'll see that there's articles, and then under that is sections. You see that? So the middle number refers to the section. Then the third number refers to the paragraph in that section. Since they're not numbered, sometimes you have to go in and, and number them. So let's, using that little code system, um, let's all go to 1811 and read that. What is 1811? As soon as you have it, raise your hand. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Okay, most important phrase is to declare war. So we're in Article 1. What's Article 1 about? Legislative. Yes, Court. legislative. Okay. While we're in Article 1, I want you to just kind of scan quickly 
it starts on page one, article one. You can write in legislature. We have the students do this. And count how many pages there are on the legislature. Article one goes clear over to page nine. All right. Then if you look at executive, how many pages are in included for executive? <coughs> Less than four, right? Okay, so what's more important? Legislature, legislative, or executive branch? Legislative branch. So many times you hear people talk about equal and separate branches. They are not equal. They were never intended to be. The legislature is the most important branch. And if you look at judicial, it's about a page and a quarter. So legislative is, I mean, uh, judicial is very small. They're all separate, but they are not equal. That's an important concept to understand. Okay, now let's all go to 441. Oh, wait, go back to the first one. Okay, so the legislature is supposed to declare war. When did the legislature last declare war? On the 11th of December, 1941. Right. <laughs> World War II. Have we had any wars since World War II? Just police action. <sighs> so our legislature has totally disregarded the Constitution. They have not followed their instruction to declare war. They are basically scaredy cats. They're afraid that, that the public is going to go against them. They're afraid of their election, whatever it might be. They have neglected to declare war that they should have been doing. Yes, Greg? Well, even beyond that, because it gives authority to the legislature to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Mm -hmm. So some of that's been taken over by executive. Executive, exactly. Okay. So when you start to study this Constitution and discover what's supposed to be done, it's just like as if you were going to a basketball game. Does the audience pretty well know the rules? Do the players know the rules? How about the referee? Now, if a team starts breaking the rules to kind of favor them, is that going to be a fair game? Okay, so this is our rules. This is the rules that we're supposed to be living by. It's the rules that our, uh, our representatives should be following. So we want to know what they're supposed to do, and we want to call them on it if they're not doing it, either by letter or, or some other source to let them know they're breaking the Constitution. Okay, now let's go to 441. Okay, so what article is it? First number is the article, so we're in Article 4. And if you look at your um, little summary here, um, Article 4 is states. Okay, so what can we learn about states? Article 4, Section 4. And there's only one paragraph, so it's paragraph one. All right. Who wants to read uh, the first part? We're going to just read the first th uh, three lines. Go. 15. 15. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Okay, good. All right. So I wanted to emphasize the word Republican. I want you to know in our Constitution, you will never find the word democracy. It is a Republican form of government that we have. It's a Republican form of government that the founders wanted us to have. And it states it right in here that not only was the national government set up as Republican, the states were supposed to, too. Yes, Lionel. Should it be Republican or Republic? We are Re a Republic. <laughs> right. Democracy. Right. It's the form uh, in the sentence where it changed it to Republican, yeah, but it well. does mean Republic. Right. Has nothing to do with the Republican Party. Right. <laughs> most uh, people in America use it wrong, and the broadcasters daily use it wrong. Use it wrong, exactly. The Republic yep. is a place where representatives are sent to make the laws for the people. Exactly. And democracy is where the majority rules. Exactly. Exactly. Mark? Democracy is, is used in the Communist Manifesto. 
Yes, they falsely use the word because republic means there's elected representatives. Well, if it's all controlled, then, then that doesn't fit, does it? In different countries, the word republic has a different meaning. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> well, I to go three times into the German Democratic Republic. And that was okay. Of, you know, uh, uh, we're going to skip the last one there because we're, we're <laughs> I can see the time slipping away. Uh, so here's a quick summary. This is the same as what's in your workbook. <coughs> Um, it's a good idea to kind of memorize this and know what uh, is the basic um, layout of the Constitution. Where do you go if you want to learn about amendments or ratifying or which branch, you know where, where to go to look that up, okay? All right. Um, so with the Constitution was set up um, a new economic system. And this is kind of the focus we want to go on for a, a little while, the free market economy. And the reason that this is so important today to discuss is um, the whole idea of socialism. So rather than complain and grumble about what's going on, we want to teach you what are the advantages of free market. Then if you hear anything uh, positive said about socialism, then you have information to counter it, and you we can start spreading the truth about those two forms of, of an economic system. So we want to understand free market economy, and um, this is what was the beginning of our amazing technology leap. This is the rise of the individual to have uh, freedom for or wealth and power and rights, all of that brought about um, through the, this, this new economic system. It was the first government that was set up with the goal of freedom for the people. What other government has been concerned about the freedom of the people? That one simple idea, when you think about what the goal of of communist countries is. It's not the freedom of the people, free conscience and making choices. So we need to appreciate what the Constitution gives us. So we can just just flood our family, They'd always be talking about these positive ideas to counter uh, the propaganda and lies that are going on in our country today. Okay? So um, as we go through the remainder of this lesson on free market, um, these are places in the Constitution that established that. The one we just read, oh no, this one is new. Uh, 188 is the Patent Office. Amendment 4 has um, a lot to do with property, personal property, and securing property for people, private uh, property and ownership. Uh, Amendment 9 acknowledges that individuals have rights that government must recognize and protect. So e these ideas for free market came from different places in the Constitution. Amendment 10 and just the whole idea of a limited government, a restrained government, a government that could not uh, step on the rights of individuals or interfere with their right of conscience. Okay. Legislature was given 20 numbered powers. The executive only had six, six things. So all of this limitation on government gave people the feeling of importance, that they have a part. This is a self-governing um, country. Okay? So here's the first question. This is now a lot of the fun slides that we have with our students. So do you like to be told what to do? <laughs> That's an easy question to answer, isn't it? So the first advantage to um, free market is that you choose what you do best. So um, that's the very, very beginning. Children in, in school are starting to think about what they want to be, and we ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then we talk about, well, how do you get to be that? And so... And then we present, you know, if you're in a communist country, then your career, your life is chosen for you. And if you study the history of Europe, families that were born into miners' families became miners, no matter what. That, they were locked in to a career. 
That was the tradition, that was the way, and that was the way the king kept it. So um, here's the first advantage, that you don't have to be told what to do. And this is an important thing for our teenagers to understand. When they grow up, they are going to have an opportunity in this country to choose what they're going to be. They don't realize what it's like under a communist government. So you can't appreciate, really, what we have unless you know what it's like elsewhere under other governments. Okay? So the second advantage is um, that hard work brings personal benefit. Um, and, and that, again, is something that um, many people don't appreciate um, and don't recognize. Um, go to, in your workbooks to the end of this lesson down at the bottom. There's a great quote from Ben Franklin. Um, who wants to be the reader this time? Go ahead, Lila. The way to wealth is as plain as the way to market. It depends chiefly on two words, industry and frugality. That is, waste neither time nor money, but make the best use of both. Without industry and frugality, nothing will do. And with them, everything. There are no gains without pains, and diligence is the mother of good luck. He that gets all he can honestly and saves all he gets, necessary expenses expected, will certainly become rich. Okay. Is this a, a principle that we want our students to know? So throughout our lessons, we sprinkle in these great American ideas that began with our founders. And as they instituted self-government, they truly gave responsibility to people to be, res to be in charge of their own success. So in this new system, then, the, um, your hard work benefits yourself. So when, when we talk about this with kids in school, when you work hard and get an A, it's going to really benefit you. And it's, it's something that um, is kind of being lost, that American greatness is tied to citizens' hard work. All of, all of this happened because they did work very hard. Okay, So some of our other advantages shows why uh, they were so willing to work hard. We talk about all these different... Um, Things that, that we do, you know, many of our kids will choose they want to be in a sport. So I said, well, you, can you just walk out on the court and be an instant great star? We talk with them about how the hard work comes first. But the hard work then benefits them personally. And, and that's something that um, is being lost with the growth of entitlements. And we know that that's a huge problem uh, creeping in, and these ideas of, of real strong principles, the original American ideas need to be retaught because they're being lost. There is a, a total uh, attitude of entitlement, and we want to counter it. So we counter it by teaching a true principle that um, personal benefit, personal reward, all of it comes from your own hard work. And, and so there's a lot of things you can talk about there with students that helps them understand that. Okay? So, um, Sarah? Yes? A, a wise person once said that the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Okay, we're going to do a fun little uh, presentation about the hard work idea. Uh, if you look in your book on page 23, there is... Um, the invention of the airplane, and I've got a little video that I want to show you about that. Um, okay, let's see if that works. <laughs> Sometimes technology messes up on you. Oh, let's see if it's going to go up. Okay. 
So it is summarized in your book. There, this was from, <laughs> it's a little um, video clip from Hillsdale College, which is on the recommended list of places to go to study the Constitution. And um, if you look at this um, page here, the Wright Brothers' Soaring Success, and it shows, gives you just the quick details of um, how they succeeded in making the first actual flight in air with their airplane. Um, about the same time that they were beginning to study, um, the federal government decided that they should help this along. So the government-funded failure was um, to give this Langley uh, $50,000 of public money. Remember, if the government gives anyone any money, it is public money that they have taken from someone else, so it's not really theirs, it's public money. There were also private donors. Everyone thought the government was going to come up with this great invention. Well, when the government tampers in it and puts money out there first before the hard work, what happens? Yep. Yes. Well, we have learned that lesson well. We have learned that lesson well. And, and the little video that I can't seem to bring up explains this, how um, when the government got involved and put up all these thousands of dollars, then it, it didn't produce anything like what the Wright brothers did with the thousand dollars of their own personal money. This is a perfect example of how government does not work. But individuals who are motivated and do the work first, then they, they benefit because they're motivated by their own hard work to accomplish something great. Yeah. Yeah, I watched a little special on the Hubble uh, uh, telescope mm -hmm. and why it was a failure at first and no one they weren't, it wasn't their own money and everything. If it was their own money, man, they would have looked at every little thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, finally it did work, but it was humongous, and then they, they had to come up with an answer to solve the problem mm -hmm. of it being put up wrong. Right, so this is just an example. When the government does it, they put up the money, and then there's not the same motivation. It's just not the same. We should learn from this old example. Okay, so moving on then to the next advantage. This is another one that Lionel mentioned, is personal ownership. Incentive. When you have the opportunity to own something, it is so uh, motivating. You just work and work and work to be able to own. And we talked to the students about how people actually own these places. It doesn't occur to them that there is an owner. Um, and when they see new clothing, somebody owns that idea for, those, for that clothing. So uh, these are um, things that people have come up with. You can come up with a whole new recipe, something that everyone loves, and then, or uh, makeup products, or new technology, or toys, or yeah, there's just so much that individuals can choose, and when they're motivated with the idea of, of eventual profit, then they're very focused on hard work. All right? So, it's important to know, under free market, you are free to own your own business and free to own your own ideas. This is not an advantage of, social, of uh, socialism or communism. Okay? All right. So we want to just take a minute and, and talk about incentive to see if it matters. Okay? So if the government had some wilderness land that they decided that they wanted to develop, here's two scenarios. Um, under a socialist government, they would put out the notice that they um, were offering minimum wage, Come and build fences, divide this property up, and then it will be sold for um, development. You know, in a new area where there's more food needed, a, a new area where we could really spread and, and have some advantage. So um, 
They're asked to build fence with, um, and they're paid minimum wage. So how hard do they work? If you just get minimum wage and you're paid daily, um, what do you really want to do? Make the job last longer? Work slower? <laughs> work just hard enough to keep from getting fired. Keep from getting fired, yeah. that's right. Okay, so here's the, the second scenario. Um, the worker is offered a job, no, let's see, the worker is offered under free market. They are told that if they, um, as much as they can fence in a week, they can purchase that property at a discounted rate. Okay, so then how are they going to work? <laughs> All right. So you see, under socialism, there's, where there's no incentive, what do you end up with? Under a free market, incentive is everything. It is highly important, and, it, and it's a natural human tendency. If you're offered um, an, in, an incentive, then it just always works. In class, we um, have the kids draw stick figures, and I time them for 10 seconds, and they'll draw one or two or kind of dawdle or do nothing, and then I bring out a bag of candy, and I say, now turn your paper over, and this time I'm going to time you for the same length of time, and you'll be given a piece of candy for each stick figure. So what do you think they do? <coughs> you say go, and they're so cute. They're just drawn. There was one little kid who drew a whole bunch of circles, lines, and a straight line for all the arms. <laughs> he had like 23. <laughs> anyway, it, uh, they are inventive. They're creative. They're hardworking when there's an incentive. And at the core of free market is incentive. And under socialism, there is no incentive. It's not important. It doesn't matter. You don't need incentive. That's exactly what they tell you. So when you talk to someone who's leaning this way, you need to keep these ideas in mind that these are our answers to what someone might, um, when, when someone might be giving all these grand ideas of how socialism could be so much better. We want to have the facts, okay? All right? So free market brings the promise of private ownership. Incentive to improve is always there, and economic efficiency. Here's another fun way of talking about uh, free market. Also part of free market is competition. Well, some people who've been in business and had maybe some failure would argue that competition isn't valuable. But look at what happens. Here's just a simple example. So on a street, you start out with one lemonade stand. If there's no competition, he can sell as much as he wants for any price that he wants. Then if on the street, some other lemonade stands open up and then there's com competition, then you've got to adjust your price. And if there continues to be more competition, you've got to get attention, you've got to have a better product, you've got to add to your product. So there's better prices, greater production, and incentive to improve. You see how important competition is? And the control of the people over the prices. So if there happens to be um, a cold week and nobody wants any ice cream or there's a recession, then the person themselves adjusts their price. So you adjust. You don't have to have government telling you what to do. So regulations, over-regulating production, really kills um, incentive and, and um, isn't needed. Okay? So these are all the advantages that come under free market. That's how this happened. That's how this came about. Because we have competition. So competition is, is very important in a free market and part of it. Okay, all right. So when you have competition, when you have, you know, freedom, does freedom come with risk? Yes. Okay, this is an idea that people need to accept, need to recognize. There is some risk with freedom. So look at these. 
great examples, great pictures that show um, that, that life comes with risk. And when you try to control and keep uh, risk out of your life, then all you can do is become a slave. A sla slaves don't have any risk. They're told what to do. They don't have to worry about where their food's coming from. There's no risk at all in their life. They just do what they're told. So it's important to understand that there is risk. Um, we allow risk or we have to trade liberty for security. This is the whole crux of the problem right now. People in America, the youth who feel entitled to things, they want security. And they're willing to take security over freedom. They don't realize what they're giving up when they cry out for security. They don't realize that they're going to lose their freedom. So one thing, uh, the visual aids again that we use in class, um, we tell the, for this idea here, we tell the story of the ant and the grasshopper. Anyone know the fable of the ant and the grasshopper? We, we actually enact it in class, it's very fun. So the, the ants in the story are being very responsible and they're collecting their food for winter and storing and working hard and working hard. And the grasshopper is not. He's just playing and dancing and singing. And so then come winter, um, the grasshopper who did not take responsibility doesn't have food, he goes begging from the ants, he doesn't have a house, so he, he gave up responsibility, and so what happened to his freedom? Responsibility and freedom come together. So if you want freedom to be like the ants and eat what you want and as much as you want and all your favorite foods, then take responsibility and collect it. Okay, so it's kind of an important idea that sometimes it's hard for people to understand that uh, responsibility and freedom are inseparable. They have to come together, and that's part of this discussion on um, liberty and security. Okay, this is in your book, so we won't take time right now to read it. It's on page 22. So we'll just go on ahead. This is really a great quote, really, really important um, for us to remember. Um, I'll just read the bold part here. It's an American cre creed by this Dean Alfange. I seek opportunity, not security. I want to dream and to build and to fail and to succeed. We have to get students to understand that, that, that fail and succeed come together. We're up and down, but we want the freedom. I want... It is my heritage to stand erect, to think, and to act for myself, not be controlled. People don't understand that under socialism, communism, you're going to be controlled. They just don't see that. Okay? Um, this, with God's help, I have done. All this is what it means to be an entrepreneur. Okay, this is the idea we want to promote, that hard work brings personal benefit, brings um, great satisfaction and accomplishment. It's what makes the technology leap happen, and um, it's the American ideal, the way that, that the country grew so strong and great. And Ben Franklin said kind of the same thing. Any society that will give up a little liberty to gain a little security deserves neither and lose both. So if you look at examples, Really, that's what happens. If you give up liberty in order to gain security, then, then you lose them both. Okay, so um, there's five advantages. This is the fifth one. Um, so free market gives responsibility to individuals for their own success. So we talk about, you know, just the comparison of the pictures who's going to succeed and who's not. So this is kind of a fun way of helping students understand this. Individuals are responsible for their own success. Government doesn't owe us anything. That is an idea that is quite contrary to a lot of popular ideas floating around in the country today. Okay, 
So you have the opportunity, build your success or allow your own failure. A principle that is so important for young kids to learn growing up. All right? So when we look at society and when we look at people, there are always those looking for a free ride. That's just part of our society, isn't it? So what happens when some choose not to work or take responsibility? Where do they turn? What do they do? They cry to the government and they give them handouts. <laughs> That's right. Okay. We do have to deal with people who have this idea, but it's so important to ask the question, should federal government take care of personal needs? This, this is a very controversial idea, and um, our students, and especially in college, have not been taught the true American ideal of you create your own success. That's what free market is all about, creating your own success. So the question we need to ask is, does the Constitution authorize? So there's the, all the debate all the time. Should the federal government do it? What should we do? Who should they go to? Well, here's the answer right here. So when you start to hear a quest, anyone asking, should the federal government do it? You say, automatically, this becomes our, our automatic answer. Well, what does the Constitution say? This is the rule book. This is what we're supposed to live by. Yeah. Um, I had looked up on, I think it was Wikipedia. Well, I'm not certain actually which one it was. But on uh, Horace Bunn, the farmer, and David Crockett. Yes. And I read, you know, what was written, and even though we don't have, um, what is the form of taxation that we originally had? Um, duties. Originally, the the t states were taxed. But but wasn't it um, on the federal government? Money was supposed to come in from tariffs, I guess. Right. Okay. Right. And how, if the government took some of that money, it you know actually cause more poverty in the long run by giving it to a few individuals. Mm -hmm. Well, today we don't have, well, I don't know. I, because of, because of the 16th Amendment, we, right. yeah. But with the other taxes, and um, from what I understand after World War II, we, our country was in such great debt, and it, understandably, mm -hmm. in many ways, why we were, but, um, they help pay off the debt by causing inflation, mm -hmm. which puts more, which is harder, especially on poor people, and it causes more poor. And I assume that's why we have more pe poor people nowadays. The national debt and all the things they're doing that hold down poor people instead yeah. of helping yeah. them. Yeah, right. you can see that, can't you? Where, you know, if someone was sick or something, individuals helping, you know, individuals, do, uh, right. civic organizations or churches or synagogues. Right, or and you'll see later in our lesson we talk about what the Constitution does say about helping. There is an answer in here, so we'll come to that. Okay, but this is the thing we want to train people to think. If there's a problem, the Constitution is the answer. So that's where we should turn to, not just have a debate on what we think government should be doing. Okay, this is the rule book that we need to understand and know. Um, great Amer Americans do not seek to receive what they have not earned by their own labor. This was the American idea. This is why people flooded to America, is because they did have the opportunity to be benefited, to um, receive the fruits of their own labor, where in these other countries they could not, could they? So when they came to America, it was because of opportunity that they were seeking. And we have to promote that idea today if we want to hold on to this free market and the great liberties that it gives and the advantages, tons of advantages, then, then we have to make sure people understand this great principle that was so important in the early days of the country. Okay? So the federal government is to promote equal opportunity not to provide equal things. So we have to teach the idea that the government does not owe people anything. That's not its purpose. Okay? 
So, uh, a little bit more about the freedom and responsibility. This is how we, we do with, rather than the ant and grasshopper story, this is what we teach with uh, the older students. Um, if you have a responsible job, whether you're a fireman or a policeman or an engineer or a judge, then you can provide, you're free to provide your own housing. So if you take responsibility, then it brings freedoms, all right? If you have a responsible workout and you work very, very hard, then you're free to perform. So there's lots of innocence. You can have great discussions with students about how freedom and responsibility are connected and um, discuss that so that they really get that concept down in their minds that um, we have to take responsibility if we want to enjoy freedoms, freedoms to do things. Okay? All right. Here's another good question to ask students and ourselves. Do you want to keep what you earn? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. It really surprises students when I, I have some little uh, play money and I'll find, find out, especially in high school, who might have had a job and how, you know, once you get a job, I can, you know, you get this paycheck and you have all these dollars and then federal government comes and takes Social Security and taxes and all these different things. So then you have only a little bit left and it, it helps them to realize that um, taxes have a huge impact on your life. So we need to make sure our, our kids growing up know that, okay? Free market does provide individual choice, responsibility, individual profit and reward. Um, there's no market regulations. There's individual ownership. These are things you want to remember so that you can talk to people about that. And, and we can overcome the propaganda and the bad ideas by just sharing the great ideas that, that are connected with free market. Okay? So this is, this is the choice that we're actually coming down to in this country. Individual freedom or government-enforced collectivism. And there are those who are promoting the whole idea of world government. You know, there's a lot of, of uh, propaganda out there concerning that too. So it really comes down to, do you want to keep what you earn? Do you want to make choices for your life? All of those things um, people don't realize are connected with free market and the economy that we have under that. Um, so the goal of free market, what's the goal of free market? Provide choice, responsibility, and reward. Right. Individual liberty. Individual responsibility, reward, and in. So what's the goal of socialism? It's controlled security. So we need to, to keep that, those words in mind, that um, socialism is controlled security. But with controlled security, you have to give up your freedom. If, if they take away your responsibility or you give it away, then you have to give away your freedom with it. Okay? So here's kind of a fun way of d defining the different systems. All right, who wants to read? We'll get some readers going here. Okay, go ahead. If you want to take your father, if, if you want your father to take care of you, that's paternalism. Okay. Someone else want to read? If you want your mother to take care of you, that's maternalism. Okay. If you want the government to take care of you, that's communism. Everybody read it. If you want to take care of yourself, that's Americanism. Okay. Okay. Back to Ben Franklin, he that would trade liberty for security deserves neither. Okay, so the problem is this slow shift towards socialism. All these different things are influencing it. Where people become more dependent on government, where they want government handouts, where they demand government handouts, that's what, what pushes towards socialism. When the Constitution is ignored, they don't even look at the Constitution for answers. Demand for equal things, the entitlement attitude. 
then it leads to excessive taxation, and look what happens then to government spending. So socialism is pure, government take it all, government give it out, how they decide. Okay, and this happens slowly. This is, this is what's going on um, in our country today. So we'll look at this next slide and see something that's, a little, that's really tricky for people to understand. We started with free market or free enterprise. About in the mid-1900s, the word capitalism came to be. And to begin with, capitalism was pretty close to free market. But by then, we already had a lot of regulations. So we didn't really have free market anymore. So we went from free market, really, to capitalism. Today, we have crony capitalism. So do you know what crony capitalism is? Mark? It's when the government or anybody else persuades markets to be opened and products to be made rather than free enterprise. Right. Dictating. OK. So there's regulations. Who are the regu regulations made for or by whom? Regulations are made to keep the wealth with the wealthy. They influence government. Wealthy people are controlling regulations to control the wealth in their own hands to prevent any kind of failure. So then we go from crony capitalism, which we have to admit, you know, don't defend crony capitalism. It is not good. It's not what the Constitution set up. It's not what made this happen. This was pure free market. And so we want to, you know, a lot of people have a lot of bad stuff to say about capitalism, and I just say, you're right. You're absolutely right. We have nothing but crony capitalism right now. And the very next step is socialism. And then from socialism, you step a little farther and you're into communism. So here's the slow shift that happens. We had free market, and these were the advantages that came with it. Now we've had this show sl slow shift towards communism or collectivism. We still have some of this. There's still evidence, that, and so people are saying, well, c communism or socialism, it works. The thing is, we still have a little bit of all these still there. We do still have private property, private ownership. There's a little bit of consumer control. There's still taxes that aren't as bad as maybe some other countries. Um, so as socialism takes over this shows slow shift, we have to recognize when it's happening that eventually government or communal ownership takes over private ownership. And um, there's limited reward for your hard work. That is happening, isn't it? Think about how much money is taken for taxes. Think about how many months you work purely to give money to uh, give up your reward for someone else to decide how to use it. Okay, competition soon is taken over by regulations and control of products, and we know what happens with taxes. If they spend more, they got to take more. Government is not a business. They don't produce anything. They don't have any way to have money to give to people without first taking from someone else. Okay? So here's kind of another fun little thing to <laughs> that helps us understand these. Okay? Socialism is this. If you have two cows, the government takes one and gives it to your neighbor. Okay? That makes sense? That what socialism is? Yep. Communism, if you have two cows, the government takes both and gives you some milk. So there, <clears throat> there you lose ownership. Fascism, if you have two cows. This is the thing that they promote, the idea of fascism. Oh, you can keep your business. You're still the owner. Well, you are still the owner, but the government takes all the milk and then sells some back to you. So all the products of any business under fascism are controlled by the government. And they claim that you have ownership, but you have no control of what you do. That's what fascism is, okay? Nazism, really bad. If you have two cows, the government shoots you and keeps the cows. <laughs> Free market, if you have two cows, you sell one and buy a bull. 
<laughs> that makes sense? <laughs> yes? I just that, found out today, Nazi is, or Nazi stands for National Socialist. It was for the National Socialist Party, and they shortened <coughs> it to Nazi. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So we love free market. We love the opportunity to make choices about our, our property. We like the opportunity to, to increase and to own what we have, uh, our, what our increase is. Okay, so free market provides <clears throat> the incentives. All of these things came about because we were in free market. There's free to try what you want, free to earn rewards, free to own, buy, and sell. That's another thing that's controlled under socialism is that you aren't allowed to sell. Okay? Free to fail or free to succeed. This happens, doesn't it? All right? Free to create wealth. So who can do all these things? Everybody. Anyone willing to work hard and take responsibility. So we keep re-emphasizing with our students the importance of hard work the importance of taking responsibility. That is the advantage of free market, giving you all of these opportunities, but the secret to it is, is recognizing that there's going to be hard work. And when we talk with these students about the one who wants to be a doctor, I say, how do you become a doctor? Got to go to college. Are you going to mind all those hours of study? And they'll say, no, I want to be a doctor. So when there's incentive, when you're doing what you've chosen, you don't mind the hard work. Someone who wants to be a, a basketball star, are you going to mind six hours on the court practicing? No, no, I love it. So we help them see when they've chosen what they want to become, then they have the incentive to work hard. So they're, they're really tied together. Because of these opportunities, America was named Land of Opportunity. And um, even just recently, here's a, a little map showing um, where Haiti is. Remember hearing about the Haitian boat people? So why didn't they just cross right there and get into Cuba if they wanted to get away from <laughs> the mess? <laughs> No, they went 600 miles zigzagging and going through treacherous waters, anything. They weren't going to go anywhere but the United States. That's where the opportunity was. Okay, so it truly did become the, the land of opportunity, the land that everyone wanted to go to. Okay, so American exceptionalism has also been under discussion in recent years. And it's important for us to understand American exceptionalism. What is exceptional in America is the idea of self-government. Our people aren't really any different than other people, but the ideas of America are exceptional. Um, American exceptionalism describes our stability, our prosperity, the liberty that's been produced by our founding documents. It has refers to um, the superior results, the consequences. The consequences, and this is what we emphasize over and over again. It's the Declaration of Independence, and well, you'll see it was absolutely critical in order to have the Constitution. And that wouldn't have happened without the Founding Fathers. So we needed all three. And that's what makes American, America exceptional. And um, even though we only have 5% of the world's population, we have 25% of the world's wealth. So you see, the, the consequence of the Constitution are amazing to notice. So it's exceptional ideas founded on the belief that freedom is endowed by the Creator. That comes to us from the, the Declaration. Constitution that carries the force of law. Equity all, for all before the law. Something that's not had in so many other countries. Citizens in tr enjoy true liberty with due process protection. So the courts are used to, to prosecute criminals and to keep 
people safe. It's not used to throw political prisoners away or to get rid of your enemy or, you know, how the court systems are so abused in other countries. So we can talk about American exceptionalism, the exceptional ideas, the exceptionally great constitution that has survived all these years. So it is in the region of ignorance that tyranny begins. This is why we're so anxious to teach Constitution. We need our youth to understand the Constitution. That's where tyranny can take over. Those who enjoy the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. And that's an important idea that um, we need, we're trying to awake an adults to the fact that we need to give more time and attention to the Constitution and make sure that our youth understand it. And that's the purpose of our organization. Okay, who wants to be Captain America and give this great quote? <sighs> Go ahead, Lionel. Read it out loud for us. Be Captain America. It doesn't matter what the press says. Doesn't matter what the politicians or the mob say. Doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something's wrong. Something wrong is something right. This nation was founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe, no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree beside the river of truth and tell the whole world. Over here? No, you move. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our Constitution holds the river of truth. And when people begin to say there's probably a better way, there's ideas being thrown around that counter the Constitution, we want to be able to stand and say, this is the truth. This is what created the, con the technology leap. We want them to understand the advantages of free market and to know that um, there is great exceptionalism in the ideas of America. So we end our lessons with um, a little pledge that we have our students repeat. Um, Constitution allowed free market. So we say we will save our Constitution and keep a good thing going. All right, that's the end of our lesson. Thank you. It was great to have you here. And